Welcome to the Sex and Psychology Podcast. My name is Dr. Justin Lay Miller. I am a research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and author of the book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Lindsay Harper, who is the founder and CEO of Rosie, an evidence-based mobile platform helping women with decreased sexual desire. She is an associate professor of OB-GYN for Texas A&M College of Medicine, a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and a fellow of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. She's been recognized by Forbes as one of the top women disrupting healthcare. Today, we're going to be talking about sexual desire and how to increase it. We'll also be talking about improving intimacy in our relationships and how technology can help us to enhance our sex lives. I'm excited for this conversation and can't wait to dive in. So let's get to it. Hello, Dr. Harper, and welcome to the Sex and Psychology Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to to get to talk with you today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to finally get a chance to connect. Um, well, not in person, but <laughs> to have a yeah. chance to talk. We were actually at the same conference earlier this year at the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health in Orlando, Florida, right before the world got shut down. And hopefully we'll be able to connect in person at a conference in the future. Absolutely. I love conferences. That may be one of the saddest things about this year. So I'm looking forward to the next one. I know the virtual meetings just aren't quite the same. So hopefully we get the situation under control and we can resume our typical conferencing. But uh, let's start by talking a little bit about sexual desire, because this is an area where you have a lot of knowledge and expertise. And This is one of the most common issues that comes up in relationships where there is what we call discrepant sexual desire, where one partner wants more sex than another partner. So why does this issue seem to be so common and why does it emerge in so many long-term relationships in the first place? Well, you know, I think that um, whenever we're talking about compatibility of any type, right, that there's always going to be differences. There's always going to be um, an example of how, you know, two people want different things and how do we resolve that? And I think um, sexuality and sexual desire is another um, expression of just the constant compromise that is a relationship. And so I think that when we think of it in that context, you know, we can imagine that it would be very common and that people would need um, real tangible evidence-based tools in order to navigate those conversations and those, um, you know, that big piece of their life. And so, you know, what's missing from our society in general today, as both you and I know, is open conversation about sexual issues, about these things that are important to all of us as individuals and in relationships. But we don't have, you know, the language that we need. We don't have the modeling that we need how to have these conversations. So it's it's a lot actually maybe like finances where you have two different, you know, spending or savings types, but we just don't have the language to negotiate or navigate those problems. And so I think that really highlights um, this particular issue because, you know, it's, 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 there can be lots of discrepancy, but yet we are not taught through any aspect of life how to, how to resolve that. And so then therefore it, it expresses itself in many ways, which can include, you know, discord within a relationship, um, health issues, right? It can also be, you know, later on down the line, family issues or separation of a, of a relationship. And so I think that the work that you do and hopefully the work that I do helps people to have the knowledge and the understanding of these issues so that then they can have a conversation and try to navigate these natural differences within relationships. And I think that everything you say is so true that communication plays a big role, not just in contributing to these issues in the first place, but also in terms of what ends up happening long-term. We find that in a lot of couples where there's a sexual desire discrepancy, they just don't talk about it at all and it leads them to disengage. And that's really the least helpful thing that they can do in those situations. But Absolutely. And, the, and really the saddest outcome, because it's like if they could have had those conversations, then maybe, you know, their whole entire lives would have been different. So I think that that's such a compelling reason, you know, to, to think about this, research it more and talk about it more. Now, communication and 
relationship factors are one of the things that influences sexual desire. But what are some of the other factors that influence sexual desire or can push it down for maybe one partner but not the other? So let's talk about where sexual desire comes from and how the factors that influence it are similar or different for men and women. Absolutely. So, you know, this is the fun thing about desire is that the, it's exhaustive, right? The list never ends. And so it could be lots of reasons. The most common reason for low desire in women particularly is stress. And, you know, there's plenty of that to go around, especially these days um, with, you know, the pandemic and all that that means in our households, the changes in our work environment, the ch you know, our children, you know, being here ever present um, changes in financial situations. You know, there's a lot of stress currently. There could also be, um, you know, medical problems that um, contribute to lack of desire. Um, if a partner has a sexual dysfunction, for example, um, you know, erectile dysfunction, something like that, that can definitely lead to a change in desire as a consequence. Um, there's, um, you know, pain um, that can happen as we experience medical conditions or as more chronic conditions with aging. Honestly, the, the cycle never ends. We can have hormonal changes, um, you know, during certain phases of our lives or after um, menopause. Um, there's, there's definitely lots of contributing factors to low desire for women particularly. Yeah. I, the way that I like to talk about desire is that it's a biopsychosocial phenomenon, that you've got these biological factors like your hormones and, uh, you know, genital pain that you might be experiencing or chronic health conditions that combine with psychosocial factors, like how your relationship is going, the amount of stress you're experiencing, and all of this comes together to, to influence desire. So it's an incredibly complex thing. But what's interesting is that when a lot of people talk about desire, they have a tendency to assume that it's almost always a, a medical issue. And we see that a lot of people just want to take a pill to try and increase their desire. And in recent years, we've seen a lot of pharmaceutical companies trying to invest in medications that can increase sexual desire, uh, such as flibanserin, uh, also known as Addy. And, you know, we could do a whole podcast just talking about the, the development of that drug and its marketing and so forth. But I'm just curious, what, what are your views on medications like this? And do you think that desire is something that can be effectively treated through pharmaceuticals? And should this be the approach that we're taking to address desire discrepancies in relationships? Yeah, I always love having this conversation because I do feel like there's so many, so much value to be gained from everybody's perspectives. My personal perspective is actually much like I think of, you know, antidepressant medications, which is that if a, if a person finds themselves in a situation, for example, low desire, and there are certain steps that they need to take in order to improve that. Maybe that is therapy. Maybe that is, you know, a re-education of sorts, a learning of pleasure, um, you know, permission in their lives. Maybe there's this whole process to get there. And so I think for some people, that's all that they need. You know, we know that education in and of itself can improve desire. Um, a lot of behavioral interventions such as self-help or erotica can improve desire. I think that once we, you know, have tried those things and we've ruled out sort of the medical, uh, um, the, the sort of co-contributing medical issues that can be, um, you know, causing low desire, I think that there is a place for pharmaceuticals like Addy or Vilesi, especially to get people over the initial hump to retrain those brain pathways, right, that have maybe been shut down for so many years, as you and I know, you know, some um, women or couples, or I'm sure men have the same story, um, will have gone a decade without having any sort of sexual activity. And and those pathways in their brain are just, you know, kind of, um, you know, they're, they're no longer being used, much like in depression. And so we need to sort of, you know, recalibrate things. I think that the best way to do this is always to address those educational and self-help opportunities or behavioral interventions. And then in conjunction, you know, when it's indicated, consider medication as a sort of pathway to complete sort of realization of the full sexual experience and, and sexual desire. Um, you know, I, I don't personally believe that it would ever be appropriate to be done in isolation without these other things. And I, and I also feel that there's opportunity um, to understand with, through research if, in fact, 
when we have a specific behavioral program in conjunction with a medication, does that increase efficacy? Does that increase compliance? And long term, what are the outcomes for that? Um, and how would that change if we discontinue the medication? Would we continue to see those changes long term? So I think there's a lot of opportunity in this entire field, but specifically in this area for us to understand more, you know, how the two might work together, how they might be complementary or synergistic, and what could the long term, you know, outcomes with a short course of medication, um, what would those results look like as well? Yeah, I think we're very much of the mindset when it, same mindset when it comes to this issue that you know there's certainly a place for medications, but that can't be the only approach that we take. And we have to look at desire and all of its complexity and all these factors that might be contributing to it because if you don't understand the cause of a given sexual problem it becomes very hard to effectively treat it and you know i think a lot of us just have this tendency to want to do the the easy thing when it comes to sex which is to just take a pill because then we don't have to deal with the much more difficult issues of navigating our relationships, changing our views on sex, dealing with sexual shame, because those are, they're big, they're tough. They are, they're difficult and they're time consuming and they're messy and they bring up, you know, things that people may not want to think about. And so I think that obviously as humans, we want a quick and easy fix. I think that, you know, just like you were expressing, that's probably not the solution in this case, but that doesn't mean that the work is not completely worthwhile. Yeah. And I think as you alluded to, there's also still so much work to be done in this area because there's still a lot that we don't understand about desire in the brain and how these medications work and how they interact with different behavioral treatments. And that's just going to continue to be an important area of research going forward. But You've actually designed an app to try and help women with low sexual desire. It's called Rosie. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create the app, how it works, and how it can potentially help users. Absolutely. So, you know, my background is that I'm an OBGYN. And sadly, and I'm sure you already know this, but um, I was not trained to treat women's sexual dysfunction, to talk about it, not even to take like what I would now consider a legitimate sexual history in medical school or residency. But, you know, and so I just started to, as my patients started to express to me their need for support in this area, I felt just really inadequate. I wasn't able to help them like I, like I was able to in other areas. And so, you know, I started thinking about that and thinking about, man, this is very different from men's sexual dysfunction. Urologists treat men's sexual dysfunction all day, every day. Who's the female analog? It's supposed to be me. But, I, but we don't get that training. And that sort of really stoked the fire of my passion for women's sexual health. Um, and then, you know, I didn't even really know where to go, but ended up finding ISWISH um, by asking around, became trained in that area and learned that, you know, there are evidence-based interventions for low sexual desire. I think speaking from a physician's perspective, the narrative in our training is it's complicated and Pandora's box and you know, I'm not a therapist. And so because of that, we just completely avoid it and shut it away. But we're often the first point of contact that someone that a woman might have, you know, to to express these um, feelings to. And if we, as her trusted medical provider, shut that down or say something like drink a glass of wine or go on vacation, like that is a negative reinforcement. She's never going to talk to anybody about that again. And so I'm super passionate about providing evidence-based resources to women, but also giving physicians and other healthcare providers a tool that they can simply say, you know what, this is a really common problem and this doctor made this app, go check it out. So we're not shutting them down. We're not giving them that information, but we are offering them sort of a, you know, handheld pathway to whatever is the next step, whether it's sex therapy, whether it's, you know, seeing a physician for a medical evaluation or a pelvic floor physical therapist, just as we have this multidisciplinary framework in our minds of the treatment of sexual problems, Rosie really was designed to try to help hold, you know, our users' hands through that process to discover what those next steps are and also be a tool for healthcare providers so that they're no longer kind of shutting down that conversation. Mm -hmm. 
And I love that so much. And we'll talk more about the app in a second, but I want to go back to something you said about your training in medical school around sexual health issues. I think something that surprises a lot of people is just how little sex education there is in medical school. I published an article on my blog sometime in the last year or so where I wrote about this recent study that looked at how much sexual health training that physicians get while they're in medical school. And I believe that it was a total of about 12 years on average over the four years of medical school, which means that only about four hours per year are devoted to sexual health. And we're trusting our physicians to take care of our sexual health needs, but we're just not equipping them with the resources to do that. Do you have any thoughts on that? that that number sounds high to me, honestly. Like I think 12 hours, I don't think I got 12 hours to be honest into medical school. But then, you know, I did four more years of residency where I focused only on women's health and women's reproductive system and, and sexually transmitted infections. Why is no one talking to me about sexual function? Like literally nobody. And so, um, I, I think that, you know, it's the societal, um, shame, right. That we have around sex that you spoke about earlier, where we, number one, don't um, acknowledge it as a, a huge part of the human experience for whatever reason. And then number two, we just sort of as a medical community, we don't want to own it. We don't want to have really anything to do with it. And I do think it's because it does feel to us as humans, not as physicians, but as humans, overly complicated or, you know, something that we don't have the time for. Um, I've been excited to see, you know, as, as, um, ACOG, which is the um, Society for OBGYNs, we have our first woman president ever. And I think that she's really, I've noticed just in the in the publications that have been promoted through our journal that there's many more this year and last year, actually sexual health articles that are being published. And so I think that there is a shift, but you know, it's kind of right now, that's where we are. We It has not been incorporated into residency training um, or medical school training. And so I do think that there's a lot more work to do. I think we're headed in the right direction, but it's going to take all of us pushing really hard and really raising flags. You know what, this is a really important part of life and we're doing our patients and the people that we're training a disservice by never talking about it. Yeah. And I, I think you're right that there are changes afoot and it's good to hear that, that things are moving in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. A long way. But related to that, I think a lot of people are also surprised to learn that even many sex therapists get very little training in sexuality issues in the course of their education. So for example, I spent three and a half years working in a counseling psychology department and we're training counseling psychologists who are going to deal with a lot of sex and relationship issues. And there was one course in our entire curriculum that was on relationships, marriage, and sex. And it's like, we're expecting them to learn everything they need to know in the span of one course in one semester. And so the reality is that for sex therapists, for physicians, they often have to go out and seek all of this mm-hmm. education and training on their own. And so we're really putting the onus on people to kind of go out of their way to learn it. And that's kind of unfortunate because a lot of people won't ever go out and, and get that training. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it's not only is it time away from your practice, it's, it costs money to go to conferences. It costs, you know, and reimbursement for, for women's sexual health issues particularly is abysmal. So it's just, it's actually like a huge, truly financial strain on a practitioner to, to take themselves to the next level in these areas. And so I've been really excited over the past, you know, year, year and a half to do grand rounds on this topic and and go to different institutions and at least say, you know what, sexual desire, it's not that complicated. That's literally the name of my grand rounds. And, you know, like here's the most five most common causes. And here's literally the very next step. So just trying to distill it down as much as possible so that people at least feel like, you know, they don't have to be the the sex medicine or the sex therapy expert, but they at least know whom to send their patients to, or, you know, the, just the one next step to not shut down the conversation. And I think that's a great sort of place to start for these educational, um, you know, situations, because it's not as if we have to expand their horizons to our entire curriculum, but at least we need to be able to say, you need to be confident at, you know, at least helping women find the, the help that they need and deserve. Mm-hmm. 
So tell us a little bit more about the app. So how does Rosie work in terms of, is it videos and articles and, and what kind of response have you gotten from users or from other physicians that you might have recommended it to? Yeah. Um, so Rosie is meant to be just sort of like a safe place. And the way I imagine in my mind is like an island of evidence-based resources for women. So because, you know, sexual function is so, um, you know, diverse and there are so many components that go into it, the app really just brings all of those things into one place. So we have a bunch of educational videos and it's basically, I was literally like sitting in lectures. I'm like, well, this is cool. And I just make like a one to three minute video that's meant to be patient facing that explains, okay, this is female sexual response. This is, you know, how fibroids and endometriosis might affect sexual function. This is, and so there's more than 50 and they're curated based on the onboarding questionnaire, which we call the sexual wellness score. But for people in the field, it's actually a combination of the female sexual function indicator, but the short form and the decreased sexual desire screener. So we have those two things that come in. And then the fifth question on the DSDS asks about, you know, what do you think could be contributing to your low desire? And we actually um, then curate the content based on the answer to that question. So for example, a patient who's menopausal with depression would get different content than a patient, and we actually call them users, than a user who is postpartum and fatigued, right? So that's all kind of filtered based on her answers. Um, then we have a library of erotica, which can also be um, filtered based on preferences. So I was actually, you know, now I've gotten into this whole world of erotica and erotica authors, and I actually connected with one of them who uses, she's actually a sex therapist turned erotica author named Dr. J, shout out. And she uses your work to, to understand, you know, like how to write, like what should she write erotica about? So I'm obsessed. Um, and so, so, and that library is evergreen. We're always publishing new content. Um, we also have a self-help section, which we call classes, where we take a deep dive into particular topics. So the first four classes were created by Lori Mintz, who wrote A Tired Woman's Guide to Passionate Sex and Becoming Cliterate. She's a therapist in Florida. And then we recently released a class um, created for us by an oncologist and a psychologist where they we talk about sexuality, thriving sexually during and after cancer diagnosis for women. Um, and then just last week, we released one on sexual pain, um, which was made by a pelvic um, and sexual pain specialist. Um, so we're really excited to be able to take deep dives. And, you know, if our users want more information on a particular topic, to share that with, with her there. We also have a community where users can inter interact. And then we just launched in Texas um, telehealth where our users can now connect with medical providers and sex therapists as well. We're just trying to break down some barriers uh, for access to care there. Yeah, I love that the app is personalized based on the individual's needs. And I also love that you're drawing on the resources and knowledge of some of my favorite people. So I actually know, I know Dr. J. She came to one of my uh, fantasy workshops that I, I put on where I teach sex therapists about the science of sexual fantasies and what they need awesome. to know. And yeah, she's she's used some of my work in terms of helping to to write erotica, which is, you know, pretty flattering. Uh, and then right. also Lori Mintz is fantastic. And I always recommend her books to people. So, uh, you know, I think that that can give people a lot more confidence in, in the work that you're doing, that you're surrounding yourself by you know, the, the best and brightest in this field. So that's great. Totally. I mean, that's the thing is I only know what I know and there's so much more out there. And that's the thing when we are talking about being multidisciplinary, we, we have to do that. And that I can't, I have no idea, you know, like I need as much help as I can get. So I'm thrilled to have all, all these, all these wonderful people on board. So tell me a little bit more about the telehealth work that you do. And also just more yep. broadly, like what is the role in the future, how is telehealth going to change our sexual health and relationships? How can we use this to enhance our intimate well-being? Absolutely. So we Rosie launched about 16 months ago. And in that time, we have about 22,000 users. And um, we also have a community of healthcare providers that are recommending Rosie. And that number is probably about 2,800 right now. So we have this healthcare community that's really excited and thriving. We have this user community that's very motivated and you know, and, and seeking out resources. And so what we wanted to do through telehealth is say, you know, we've got these educational tools, we've got these behavioral tools, but a lot of women need the next step, right? They need a medical provider or they need 
um, a therapist, or they just need someone to kind of break it down with them, right? It's a lot for someone to kind of figure out on their own. So that's really the, the vision for Rosie Telehealth. And we want to continue to represent that multidisciplinary model, which is why we have both medical providers and sex therapists. So, you know, we're the, what we're trying to do is set up, you know, a, a virtual version of what you might find at a, at a sex medicine clinic, which is where we recognize that all people, you know, need to be involved in this process. And that way we can bring help to women who maybe live in rural cities, right, across the country, as most women do, or who have, you know, barriers because of um, financial reasons. You know, we know that these sex medicine clinics can be super expensive, or if they just don't want to search, like if they want to have someone who's kind of been vetted and who is trusted, you know, by me, um, then, then we've sort of got that community vetted. And so I think it's, you know, it's interesting. We've always planned telehealth for Rosie literally since 2018. It's been on the roadmap for Q2 of 2020. <laughs> um, and it just so happens that, you know, now telehealth is kind of necessary in all areas of our, of our care. And so I'm really excited about that because I, you know, we can see in practice that it's not only increased adoption on the, on the patient side of telehealth as a service or as a legitimate offering, but it's also really ramped it up on the provider side. As an OBGYN, I mean, we're super busy in the hospital. We're busy seeing patients, you know, like, uh, you know, back to back to back. And the idea that I would have ever gone into telehealth as a, as a private practitioner, you know, would have been very slim to none. But now we all sort of recognize we can have very meaningful visits um, and get a lot accomplished through these services. They're definitely not, um, you know, end all be all, especially from the medical side. You know, you still need to have a physical exam in some situations and you still may need some imaging or some labs. Um, but um, we can definitely do a lot with the resources that we have. And it's not a reason not to do it for sure, those limitations. Right. So telehealth is a way that we can expand the resources, we can expand the reach. Um, I'm also curious, just do you think that when people are using telehealth specifically for sexual health services, mm -hmm. do you think that that might actually make it easier for them to talk about some of their sexual health concerns? Because I know a lot of people feel really intimidated and uncomfortable talking to their doctors about their, their sexual health needs. So do you think that that helps in terms of reducing barriers in that way? You know, I really do. I think that there's a couple of ways actually that it does that. You know, you're not um, you know that the people that are sort of on a telehealth platform, particularly for sexual health, that they're going to receive your, you know, your um, problems or your story with, um, you know, acceptance and an understanding and actually have a, a valid knowledge base. So I think that that sort of removes some trepidation that people might have just talking to their, you know, general OBGYN or their family practitioner about these things because they're not quite sure, like, am I allowed to talk about this? I hear about that a lot. I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about this with that kind of doctor, you know? And so first that permission is granted in, in this virtual space, but also, you know, then it decreases, there's still, people are still uncomfortable, right? That very first conversation you have, you can you can see it. You can hear it. It's, there's a lot going on there. Um, but I do think that it does remove the barriers, the, you know, the geographic barriers, the being sort of in a same physical space barriers. Maybe there's something to being in your own sort of comfortable situation where there's some, you know, familiar um, things to, to feel and smell and see that that gives them an extra sense of, um, you know, um, comfort or, or something like that. So I think it, it definitely could work in two ways that it might be especially pertinent to our field, you know, the idea of, of virtual care. Mm -hmm. So we only have a few minutes left, but there's something else that I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, you're on the front lines every day treating people's sexual health needs and concerns and sexual desire and desire discrepancies are certainly one of the big things you see. But I'm curious in terms of other patients who come in, what are some of the most common myths and misconceptions that you deal with as a healthcare provider that people have around sexuality or, or relationships? We know that people get a lot of things wrong about sex. Totally. In part because our sex education system in the U.S. is pretty abysmal and, and lacking in a lot of ways. So, so what are some of those common misconceptions and how should people be thinking about them instead? Yeah, I mean, I think for the the women that I see, I would say that the most like 
common and also the most hurtful misconception to them as people and as patients is that, you know, sexual dysfunction or sexual problems, if it's not even a dysfunction, maybe even sexual questions are not that common, right? That everyone else has it figured out and they're the only weird person that exists on the planet with this issue. And that to me is probably the biggest barrier of a lot of things, the barrier to seek treatment, the barrier to talk about it with their partners, the barrier, you know, to, to get this message out bigger and maybe not be so ashamed about talking about it. And I just, you know, I'll, when I first started getting interested in this, I had a young patient in her young 20s. Um, and she just said, I feel like if I tell anybody about this, they're going to look at me like I have three heads. And this is really the day where I was like, seriously, like the two people before you just told me this exact same problem. And I'm sure that I went on to see multiple other patients with her afterwards with the same complaint. And that to me is the biggest sort of, you know, sheet that we have to pull off of, of sexual problems is they're, they're really common and there there's plenty of things we can do about them. It's not a death sentence to you or to your relationship or it doesn't mean that something's broken or wrong with you. And I think that with that embarrassment and secrecy and shame and isolation comes all of those sort of secondary judgment about oneself. And I just, that just, honestly, it breaks my heart. And any, anytime someone, you know, feels the safety to disclose, I just think that's such a, amazing, um, opportunity to really meet that with, you know, empathy and compassion, because I just really know that that moment can change the trajectory, you know, of, of that person's life. And so I, that to me is probably the biggest misconception and, and root of the problem. Yeah, it's so true. And it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning about communication and how we haven't normalized conversations right. about sex. And so this leads so many people to feel weird about themselves, what it is that turns them on or when they're dealing with a sexual problem. And that leads a lot of people to end up suffering in silence. And I think it's helpful for a lot of people to recognize that most of us will experience one or more sexual difficulties at some point in our lives. But the vast majority of those difficulties are treatable. There are solutions that are available, but in order to access them, we have to get more comfortable just talking about sex. Absolutely. That's the key to everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Harper. This has been a wonderful conversation and I appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. So where can my listeners go to learn more about your work and your app, Rosie? Well, first, thank you for having me. This is like so exciting for me. Um, and if anybody wants to find out more about Rosie, our website is meetrosie, M-E-E-T-R-O-S-Y dot com. And then our the app is available in um, either Apple or Google Play. And it, you just search Rosie, R-O-S-Y. And um, you can download it for free. Um, and then if there are any, you know, sex therapists or other healthcare professionals, mental health professionals listening, um, we also have a healthcare provider tab on our website where all healthcare professionals can, and mental health professionals can sign up and we'll kind of onboard you as a, as a rosy sort of friend. And we'll send you a box with some cards for clients or patients that you can then share with your, um, with your clientele if you're interested. And you can check us out and make sure we, we haven't lost our minds in there too. I always, you know, you always want to vet your, the things you're recommending. So that'll allow that opportunity as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you again for your time, Dr. Harper. And thank you all for listening. And be sure to check out the Rosie app at meetrosie.com. You can keep up with new episodes of the podcast by following my sex and psychology blog at sexandpsychology.com or by subscribing on Apple, where I'd really appreciate you taking a moment to rate it and leave a review. Also, be sure to check out my book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life, which was just released in paperback edition. Thanks again for listening. See you next time. <laughs>